Hi, I'm India Fisher, and this is The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. Hi Philip, how are you? I am excellent, thank you. We've got lots and lots of good things for this episode. We've got India Fisher coming up shortly. So I know she's, I think I'm right in saying that she is your favourite Big Finish companion. Um, so that's going to be a a thrill, but before we get to India, there's a couple of little things that we normally do. Uh, first of all, Philip, big announcement you've got for the Sirens of Audio once again, and the Sirens of Audio audience and anyone else who wants to come along. Well, yeah, if you're in Australia anyway. (laughs) So yes, we've been lucky enough to, uh, have Wendy Padbury agree to come and come to a couple of events. And so at the moment we have Wendy, um, booked to come to Sydney in February on the 10th. And then she's going to fly down to Melbourne and she'll be there for dinner on the 17th and then at a day event on the 18th. So Sydney will have on the Saturday for both an event and then dinner afterwards, the VIPs. Melbourne will be the dinner with the 17th event on the 18th. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not putting it past maybe trying to set, fix it, fit in one of the cities as well. But I, I, that might be a bit hard. But I'm, I'm trying because I'm fed up with the people in Brisbane whinging at me. And so I'm seeing what I can do, whether we can possibly fly up there as well and fit that in. What about uh, what about Geraldton in Western Australia? I might be near there at the time. <laughs> well, there's, there's I, might be about, from, I might be about eight hours away. I can drive down. <laughs> there's some from, someone in Western Australia having a whinge that um, <laughs> we're too far away. Um, yeah, I mean, I, who knows? Maybe maybe one. Well, day I can empathise. I, I can empathise. We can do a whole Australian tour. Um, yeah, six capital cities in three weeks. I don't know. It'd be lovely to do. It's just what, what what's feasible and affordable and all that stuff. But yeah, you know, Wendy has always been a favourite of mine. Um, to me, she's the you know her and Jamie and the the second Doctor are just the perfect um, TARDIS team for the second Doctor. Um, and um, oh, as well as that, too, I just mentioned too that um, Wendy's daughter Charlie Hayes is also coming with her as well. And big finished listeners will know Charlie. She's been in so much stuff. She's done some stuff with her mother. A couple of companion chronicles, but she's appeared in lots of other stories as well. So yeah, you, there's also been an opportunity to meet Charlie Hayes as well for the big Finnish fans. Excellent. So to get more information on the event plus your tickets, you can head over to wendypadbury.sirensofaudio.com. All the info is there. The links to the Sydney and Melbourne events are up and. Who knows? If you complain enough to Philip, uh, there might be another city very soon. <laughs> well, we'll see. I'm, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll do my best. See what happens. Exactly. All right, we're going to get to India Fisher, Fisher shortly, but uh, before we do, do you know what? No, what, Dwayne? We need to jump down that rabbit hole. Come with me, Philip. Let's go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like it, getting in on the uh, the old down gesturing action, Philip. That's well, great. I, I, when Nick when Nick when Nick did the uh, whole rabbit ears, he did the rabbit ears. I like that. Rabbit, I was thinking, oh, I'm not I'm not into this <laughs> at all. <laughs> it's amazing how many people are. Uh, mm. But I thought we would keep it on topic today and just talk about the character of Charlie and why you think, or what, what, do you th- do you think she's better because she's a companion who's traveled with two different doctors but not in the traditional way like there's been many companions who have traveled with two with two different incarnations of the doctor going way back to ben and polly but they were sequential um charlie on the other hand traveled with the eighth doctor 
finished with the eighth doctor and then went back and traveled with the sixth doctor. So my question to you, Philip is, um, do you think it's probably a hard question, which, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. Which doctor do you think she works best with? I think she's different enough for both doctors that she works really well with both. So with the eighth doctor, when we first meet her, she's the plucky adventurous, but she's very young. She's a bit naive, but she's just full of adventure and excitement and wants to the world. So I think her and young eighth doctor, um, I think later on the eighth doctor is damaged by relationships and becomes a bit more battle weary and tired. But early on, he's just full of life and vigor and excitement. Charlie, Brings that out of him as well. She is too. She's too. So the two of them are just having so much fun. And it is it's that fun, that excitement, which is why I love love that era so much. It's just so much joy and yeah, it's, it's just a wonderful era. By the end of her time with the eighth doctor, though, she's seen a lot, she understands a lot. And then she ends up by accident with the sixth doctor, but he can't know who she is because of the timelines. And you know, she's not like she hasn't done enough damage to the timelines anyway. And so the, the sixth doctor is more suspicious of her. She's yes. being more secretive. So it's a totally different relationship because she can't be the same person. And so she's more secretive. He knows he can trust her, but he knows there's things he can't trust about her. Um, she can't reveal things about his future because that will damage the timelines. It's all very, it's a very different relationship. But there's still this strong bond between them. He knows there's more there, but can't get to it. She needs. She has to protect him, but they have great adventures as well. So, in terms of, I mean, that era of the, with the Eighth Doctor, I prefer simply because I just love Charlie and the Eighth Doctor, and I love their life, uh, their zestful life. It's and that's the wide-eyed why I, adventure, isn't it? it? Yeah. And so, when when they did the box set a couple of years ago, the Further Adventurous, um, of the you know that was a fantastic box set, and we know she's coming back now this month for a Christmas adventure. And once again, it's, that, it's set during that early period, before Zagreus, before the oh, Divergent Universe. So it's, before Carys, gonna, yeah. Before Carys. So she's going to be this. She's going to be the bouncy, fun. It's just going to be marvelous again. So yeah. So did you that, get it? To, did it? Oh, that's that's right. That's what I was going to ask you because, like, when we were speaking, um, with Nick, I think it was you hadn't heard the end of Audacity as yet. No, I was at ten uh, minutes from the end. Yeah, yeah, and and she comes in in the last couple of minutes. Did you did you get a, any kind of a twinge of oh, I wanted Audacity to have a bit more of a chance rather than than get sort of crowded with Charlie? What do you think about no. the potential of that dynamic? Um, do you um, think the characters are yeah. all strong enough to just kind of work together and bounce off each other just easily enough? You think it's a good question. I mean, Audacity is a, a wonderful character, and and that, that little box set was just such a wonderful stories. But no, I was so glad to have Charlie back. I don't. I, I'm happy that Audacity hasn't got more time alone. I think that. I mean, they're both from the past. They're both. Um, I think Charlie, in terms of this, in the, in the story, is going to still be younger than Audacity, and still a bit more, bit, bit naive and and joyous of the world. Audacity's a bit more world weary. She's been through more. I think they're going to get on well. But no, I did. I didn't want more stories. So once I knew Charlie was back, I was. Yeah, you know, let's go with Charlie because. I think it's going to be a great dynamic. Yeah. And that release is actually uh, just out in the last 24 hours or so at the time of recording. So by the time this goes out, it'll be out a few days. Have you downloaded it and started listening? I haven't realized it was out. Well, I, yeah. I, 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 did the press release come out from Big Finish that was released. Uh, the, the newsletter's actually come out and there's been tweets as well. Oh, okay. Well, I know what I'm going to be doing once uh, we finish here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've actually I've actually been listening to the master box sets, the War Master, the last couple okay. of days. And, oh, That's Rogues did. Gallery or Rogue, Rogue Gallery. So, Rogue, I don't know. It's brilliant. Like just Derek Derek Jacobi is always just is always is amazing. And and I've only listened to the first two stories. It's, the two of them are just totally different already. And you is this Scott keep... Hancock's last one? I think it might be. I don't know. Who knows? How he had one banks. or two to go. I can't remember he, if this was the last one. It's done, done mm. quite a while ago. Mm. But uh, you, you want to like this guy. Like, you, you <laughs> really want to like the master, and then he'll just do something so hideous. You go, oh, you can't. But it, it's, <laughs> it's so hard because you like him so much, and then he just does the most evil things. 
So yeah, it's great box. If you, yeah, Warmaster, Dirk Jacoby, it's wonderful. Fantastic. All right. Well, on the subject of Charlie, let's crawl up out of the rabbit hole and we'll throw in a trailer for something before we bring India Fisher on. Uh, and Philip, I'd like you to choose which one. Is there an obvious choice that we should throw in? Uh, I don't know whether it's obvious or not. I mean, I mean, the obvious one would be something like Storm Warning. But let's do yeah. something a bit more fun. Um, and let's do Invaders from Mars. Ooh, okay. Doctor Who, Invaders from Mars. Listen, we are still heading for Singapore, aren't we? Of course. Singapore? 1930? Perhaps, let me see. 34th Street and Broadway. Not Singapore. Well, judging by that skyline and that taxi driver's language. And that dead man. And that dead man. Oh, I'd have to say New York City. Will you get moving, you great lunk? Hey, hey. You can hurry, genius, my friend. There's a fine art to successful chicanery. Man, you don't even know what that means. What is this place called? No, New Jersey. Is N New Jersey the place where your weapons are kept? Uh, no, sir. Uh... Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Huh? Who wrote this crap? I certainly didn't write this crap. You will, Orson, you will. We'll take Manhattan and Staten Island too. <laughs> Luigi, could we have the tap, please? Si, Signor Cheney. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance and is the holiday offering it was intended to be. So, for a number of years, we have been discussing and talking about um, our love of Charlie and the character of Charlie, and we're very blessed today to have India Fisher with us. India, welcome to Sirens of Audio. Hello, thank you for having me. The wonders of modern technology, eh? Like it, is a, it is amazing. <laughs> Can I just say, you have such a professional-looking... Uh, set up. I'm feeling so inadequate with our little. <laughs> well, well. I mean, is this is this just audio? Is this an audio podcast or is this no, a no? We're, we're looking at you as well. Oh hi! Yeah, I'll stop gurning then. Uh, well, yes, it's it looks professional, except this is an IKEA throw, and that's my bedroom behind there. So I am genuinely in a cupboard, but um, I had to create it for COVID. We had to do a lot of things for COVID, didn't we? So um, yes, this is now where I do all of my work. <laughs> Indeed. And I believe you have a podcast, don't you? I do. I do. I've just started a podcast this year. Yeah. On the, on the menopause. On menopause. I have listened yeah. to an episode. <laughs> did you? Bless you. That's very I good. Did. I went, no, I'm not going to listen to any more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Too many women complaining. It's fine. Uh, but yes, it hit me about a year ago and I didn't know what the hell was going on with myself. So um, yeah, I decided, I decided to find out. And Nick Briggs actually said to me when I suggested it to him, because I obviously went to him and went, I don't know what I'm doing with a podcast. Can you please give me some technical advice? And he said, only you would decide. I know nothing about this subject, so I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. But uh, that's me. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> well, anyhow, I mean, the, the episode I listened to was um, both informed, but also amusing and very honest. And so, oh, um, thank you. yeah, so for our female <laughs> people out there want to learn more about the menopause, I mean, so I'm sure it's actually probably men should listen to it more. I, mean, no, uh, I was going to say, yeah, it's for everyone, uninformed. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I get, I get that actually. It's a, it's a mainly a female thing to begin with. But uh, yeah, I do make my husband listen to a few. He hasn't well, listened good to for him one too. Yeah, <laughs> he gets so it from it, the other. It's, it's a podcast my wife and I can listen to together now. There you go. Oh my goodness, what a beautiful <laughs> image! Yes, <laughs> yeah, <how laughs> bringing, romantic. To, <laughs> bringing yeah. couples of the world. I get the candles together. out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've listened to why you're being such a harridan, my love. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back a bit, be, a bit long before the menopause. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, let, let's long start into before the, the menopause. Long slightly before terrifyingly. The, let, let's actually go back in terms of, a bit more in terms of um, where you were born, where you grew up. Tell us a bit about your family. Oh, right. Well, um, way, I way was, back, yes. 
Way, way back. Right. Okay. So I was, I was born, I've always been England. I was born in London, but then we moved to uh, sort of the central area of England, the Staffordshire Moors and uh, grew up there. And uh, my parents did a very seventies thing. I don't know whether you had this um, program called the good life, which was where, yeah, you see. So they were, they basically went and did, my mum is sort of basically Margot, but uh, they did the Tom and Barbara bit of they went and tried to do a small holding and be um, self-sufficient. And so that was the first seven years of my life. And then my dad became MP for Stoke-on-Trent, which is bang in the centre of uh, the country. And uh, so we moved there when I was about four, uh, seven to 14. And then I moved back to London. So I've sort of, yeah. Uh, my dad was an MP. My mum was his secretary. Uh, we've always been very arty as a family. My sister's an actress and uh, she's been in some big finish. And my brother's a musician. I have another brother who is less arty, but he would say he's the most creative of all of us because he actually creates his work, whereas we get given scripts. Sorry, can you hear my really barky dog in the background? <laughs> I don't know whether you can or whether it's just No, me. no, you should, when, I, when my dogs go off, you'll know. So, yeah, that's not bad at all. <laughs> oh, really? Well, yeah, he's a small, yappy dog. We didn't realise he was going to be a small, yappy dog. He was a rescue dog. And they kept saying to us, oh, he's got big paws. He might be big. And my husband was like, that's fine. That's fine. And I thought, we've got a small house. I don't want a big dog. But then he didn't grow up. He just grew long. So he's uh, sort of a weird looking thing, but yeah, he has small he's dog loved, mentality. I'm sure. He is very loved, not by my husband, but he's loved by me and my boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's four of you. It's four siblings in your family. So four siblings. Four. I'm the youngest of four. Yep, yep. So and um, how long was your dad an MP for? Oh, twenty five years, like until he retired. Yeah. So um, yeah, my, all my life really. So from the age of eight to uh, yeah, a few years ago. So how did you become uh, involved in the arts? How did I become involved in the arts? Hmm. Well, he was very, very arty. He was, um, before he was an MP, he was a, a teacher and he used to get sort of poets to come and uh, artists. And so we were always surrounded by very arty people. And he he doesn't really, uh, he doesn't rate the sciences. He rates the arts. And uh, I'm not sure I agree with him. I'm pushing my boys to be architects. <laughs> like, do something sensible. <laughs> don't don't end up in your like sort of 50s going, oh, I've got no pension and uh, what am I going to do? But uh, yeah, so we were always brought up to be very arty. And um, so I just, I just loved the theatre. And um, then I started doing drama lessons when I was about 11. And I realised I really loved being on stage. It was one of those things that I just thought, oh, I can do this. I like this. This makes me feel good about myself. And so it sort of went from there, really. I did um, drama GCSE. Then I didn't do drama A-level because I was sensible and I thought I'll have some proper A-levels to fall back on. Uh, but then I did do drama and English at uh, Manchester University and then just tried to become an actress, really. So you... Part of the, the appeal of Charlie and, and you is just, you've got the most beautiful voice. Um, oh. how, how did that develop in terms of, is, is, is it just how your family speak? I mean, you say, you know, you started at Manchester, you got no Manchester in you. Um, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Well, um, no, yeah, I said that was university. No, there's no Manchester. Well, actually, yeah, this is how, um, so in terms of accent, yes, this is how I was brought up, you know, a very middle class called India. We moved to Stoke-on-Trent, which is not middle class in any way, shape or form. And um, I was really badly bullied and uh, thought, this is not good. I can't be called India and sound like this. Um, my life is just not going to be worth living. So my brother and I affected a Stoke accent when we were growing up to try and um, fit in a bit more. I was very keen on, I just wanted to be called Jane and be like everyone else. I didn't want to be Jane. different. Yeah, 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 exactly. But uh, uh, I love it now. I, uh, I It's a very good. People remember it. But um, at that age, people remembered it for all the wrong reasons. So, uh, yeah, this, so this is my normal accent, but I've always been quite good at different accents. Although you wouldn't know because Big Finish never allow me to do any different accents. <laughs> well, you got to establish too quickly as one character, didn't you? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Well, you talk about... Um, Oh, sorry. Hmm. Oh, no, 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 go on, go on. You did what? No, I was going to say I did things like um, Dead Ringers, which is a TV programme over here. And so that was lots of different um, impersonations and things like that, which was really good fun. I like doing that. Hmm. Before being finished, what sort of other acting work had you been doing? 
Well, it was I was very young, so um, not that much. I was sort of trying to scrabble my way up and try and find an agent. And so I was doing, you know, awful look back now. And I think I was doing, you know, bits in theatres above pubs. And there was a there was a time when I, I was actually in the pub doing theatre. And so we this guy, this wonderful man, Ronnie, used to set up. He wanted to bring because he loved the theatre. He wanted to bring theatre to people rather than people going to the theatre. He was like, my people aren't coming to the theatre, so we're going to go. We had a little sort of um, backdrop and it was just two-handed, like man, and, uh, girl and boy sort of little vignettes. And I remember one time walking in and there was like a huge screen with the with the boxing match on. And they were like, yeah, just set up underneath that. And it was like... Okay, great. So I had a, I had all my costumes in my, on a, in a sort of bag over my shoulder, and um, one of them was a nurse. So I had a nurse's costume, and someone went, "Are you the stripper?" And I was like, "Oh God, am I so-? <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it was a checkered start to my career. So I was very, very grateful. I went up and did um, Edinburgh, and that's where Jason uh first saw me and so Jason Hay Gallery and he came round after the show and said I think you're really good here's my card and I thought yeah right uh but then I uh then I got back to uh London and thought all right I better ring this person let's see whether he uh, actually is what he says he is because he said I'm a big producer so he said he was a big producer or a big yeah. Finnish Finnish producer oh uh, well yeah 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 no he said he said he was very honest about what he did he said I'm a producer I'm looking for a big um a bank of library of voices because we're going to be doing these audios and uh, he said i'd really love you to come and audition and so um yeah at the time i thought mm, i don't believe you oh yeah but, pick up um, line yeah 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 exactly and uh but uh like so then i went and i did an audition above a pub and again above a pub in the gray's inn road and uh I remember um, Nick was there looking rather similar to me, just behind a desk with big headphones on. And uh, Gary was there and they genuinely, it was one of the hardest auditions I've ever had because they gave me a wadge of paper, like I'm um, like a ream of paper of scripts. And downstairs in the pub, they went, have a look through these and um, see how many different accents you can do, how many different voices. Uh, okay, we'll be we'll be back in 10 minutes. And I was, you know, desperately flicking through trying to find things. And Gary still talks about, the fact that I did a Margaret Thatcher impersonation. And he said, that's just the best Margaret Thatcher impersonation. And I thought, I don't even remember doing that. That was obviously such rabbit in a headlights. I have to do something that he always says, oh, your Margaret Thatcher was brilliant. I was like, is it? Okay, great. I'm glad. I'm glad that got me the job. But yeah, then I, I did... Um, Winter for the Dead. Winter so, for yeah, the so Dead. So- Yes, yeah, so, so your first so your first show was a prim schoolgirl um, RP, yeah. Winter for the yeah. Dead. Um, yeah, so with my with great Peter... friend, my best friend from university, uh, Liz Sutherland, who's done a lot for uh, Big Finish as oh, well, right. and Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, do you remember much about that? Actually, coming in for the first time and recording that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was I'd done no um, mic work. I didn't know how it worked at all, and I was convinced that you sort of had to move away from it to breathe. So I'd sort of step forward, I'd say my line, and then I go. <laughs> so then Brian, like I was I was completely we didn't have a clue what we were doing. And then actually it was it was through working with Paul that I realized how physical you can be in front of a microphone and actually the more physical you are, especially for something like Big Finish, where they you know, where you're falling through trees or you're jumping on a moving, you know, a paving stone or all these sort of crazy things fighting uh, you have to be physical otherwise it just doesn't come across the people that stand there and think it's all going to come out of my voice it doesn't work that way but yeah I do remember Liz and I going home after the first day and just being so excited we were just, we just had the best fun and then we were going and we got paid for that uh very young <laughs> always nice to be paid so yeah, how long exactly. after that? How long after that did they contact you and talk to you about Charlie? Oh, a long time. Like I, I just thought that was it, right? Okay, not going to hear from them again. And um, I don't know. It seemed like a very long time. It may have been six to you know six nine months. I think maybe Jason may tell me differently. Um, but uh, yeah, then they Jason called me and said. Um, I'd really, in fact, it's one of those moments I can absolutely picture where I was and what I was doing. And uh, he phoned me up and said, we'd like you to be um, Paul McGann's companion. And obviously I've been quite vocal in the past about the fact that I was a big with an L&I fan and 
you know, it was, it was like saying, do you want to, you know, work with Harrison Ford? It's like, yes, please. <laughs> I'll be Paul McGann's companion. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> so um, how did the whole meeting with Paul go and those first, because I think originally you, you didn't, you didn't do them in London. You had, you traveled to where Paul was. Yeah, we traveled. Yeah, we traveled to Bristol and actually that was really nice because it meant that they cast the whole series. So we recorded four in a block in a week and um, they cast, they threw cast it. So everyone had different parts in different uh, in the different uh, plays. So it meant that you felt like you were a sort of a, a company like you would be in a stage, you know, performance and you got really close to people and you, there was a really lovely camaraderie and we were all staying in the same hotel and it just, it was, it was a really nice time. And Paul was obviously lovely and I learned so much from watching Paul. In fact, the reason I always put one ear out, people always uh, laugh at me, like proper techie people go, you know, why aren't you doing that? But I can't do that because that sounds really weird to me. I have to have, the ability to hear my own voice as it sounds through one ear. But that was because Paul did it. So I saw Paul and went, all right, that's what you do then. Right, okay. <laughs> I just copied him. So you talk about a long time. I just double-checked. You recorded Winter for the Dept in March 2000, and you recorded yeah. Storm Warning in May 2000. Yeah, but I don't think they were actually, were they recorded? That's maybe when they came out. No, it's saying record, that's recorded. It's recorded? Oh, well, mm. there you go. That's uh, it, Assuming thought. the website's... I mean, okay, don't trust the website. It's a big... <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, don't trust my memory. No, no, no. Trust the website <laughs> more than my memory. My memory. It may have just felt like a long time. Yeah. I, <laughs> maybe it was a long time in between auditioning and Winter for the Adept. I think that probably, was the... That probably, I thought, well, I'm time. never going to hear from them again. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That may have been it. Um, you, know, you, you and Paul just seem to click straight away in storm warning and uh, did you record them do you know whether you called them in order or did you mix up the yeah and we definitely recorded storm warning first i think we i think we did record those early ones in pretty much order um but storm warning was definitely the first one and i've i've said it before and it's i will always uh big up alan barnes i mean there is no there was no acting required for me with charlie she leapt out of the script the minute i read it and and i think you can credit that with also the chemistry between paul and i i mean obviously it helped that you know i was a massive fan of his and uh, and he's lovely and so we got on really well but the energy from that first encounter between charlie and the doctor it, you know, sort of, it it helped our energy as well. You know, I think it was so well written that you couldn't help but click instantly when playing those characters together. Doctor Who, Storm Warning. Memoirs of an Edwardian Adventuress by Charlotte E. Pollard. Chapter One. Candy floss clouds scattered as the mighty dirigible soared into the black night sky. Raise your glasses, gentlemen. I give you the R101. The R101. Ah, oh, frailing. Over here, man, over here. Maybe they wouldn't be singing our praises, Lord Tamworth, if they knew that this ship hadn't completed its trial. Shh, shh, shh. Not having this, not again. Safe as houses. On paper, sir. On paper. Incredible. A time ship crashing. And again. And again. I watched as the full moon shimmered into view, casting silver rays about the cabin Perfect. when... Oh no, Vortisor swarming to pick over the debris. Get away from there, you vultures! Leave that wreck in peace! I need you, Frailing. The Prime Minister needs you. Your king and your country need you to be stout, dependable and strong. It's just like I say, if I remember my Earth history correctly, the R-101 airship took to the skies for her maiden voyage to India early in October 1930. Yes, and? And crashed in flames in France during a storm in the early hours of the next morning, killing everyone aboard. What the devil? Oh! Oh! By something. Never mind that now, Freeling. Look what that silly ass has done to me best mess trousers. Oh, look, I'm really very sorry. I couldn't. I mean, I've. Uh... Whoops. Now, who exactly are you, and just how do you come to be aboard my airship? Is that the greetings over with? <sighs> what? I'm the doctor, by the way. Oh, I'm Charlotte. Charlotte Pollard. 
Charlie to my friends. But it might be worth keeping an eye on that one as our little adventure progresses. They're breaking through. They're... God speed you on your way, airship R101, and God bless your passengers, the true masters of the air. You also got to work with people like um, Nicholas Courtney, um, mm. and other big Doctor Who things. Did, did did you actually have much of a history with Doctor Who at all before? Well, um, I obviously I was a child of the you know seventies and eighties, so yeah, I mean you know Doctor Who was always on, but I wasn't a huge Doctor Who fan. I have I have admitted this I'm for now, <laughs> but I was a I was a Star Wars fan. So I my brothers were into Star Wars, and so that's sort of what I was. Uh, but obviously I knew about Doctor Who. You can't not know about Doctor Who. And, uh, you know, Tom Baker was my doctor, I would say. And so I didn't I didn't know the hugeness of what I was getting into. I remember someone at one of the conventions early on coming up to me and going, you do realise you're going to be doing this until you until you retire. And I was like, no, don't be silly. And like, you know, here we are 20 odd years later. Um but yeah, so I mean, working with Nick was just such a lovely man, and uh, and there were some amazing the cast, you know, there were some huge people in those early days, like sort of Simon Pegg, uh, Jessica Stevens as she was then, Jessica Hines, and you know, and Mark Gatiss. It, it was just it was extraordinary, really. Um, and I was, you know, I didn't, I don't think I realised at the time how quite how lucky I was. I was sort of, you know mid early 20s and thinking you know oh this is the norm this is fine <laughs> it's it's hard to 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 realize that at that time there was no doctor who on television it seems to have been around for such a long time again now on television but then mm-hmm. there'd been a long time when doctor who hadn't been on television and you and paul making these episodes this was brand new doctor who so it wasn't established doctors and companions you know, going back, so to speak. This was new episodes going forward. Was there a sense of was there a sense of uh, pressure at all in in making something new and uh, that that you could sense from maybe Gary or the other writers, well, for instance? I don't know. No, they were very good about not instilling that pressure. I think they were just really excited. You know, I think all the big finish. Uh, boys are boys men are are fanboys aren't they 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 do it for the love of doctor who and so that that was very infectious and i don't think i realized i was certainly in those early couple of um series sub series i didn't realize the sort of the enormity of it i think the only so the first time it really struck me was the 40th anniversary in panopticon and I was doing something and like put they Paul and I had gone on stage and Paul was a bit like mm, I don't know don't know I don't really want to go on and then the whole place just erupted and you saw him just go oh, oh this is okay actually I don't mind this and um and it did feel like wow this is like sort of rock star status and then I I did a thing of I was walking across a foyer with someone to get to a next signing or something and someone said, oh, can you sign this for me? And I said, oh, yeah, stopped. And the the poor, the poor organiser was like, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And I was like, no, no, I'll just sign it. And then literally there were sort of 300 people around me. And I thought, my God, this is like a tiny, tiny taste of what it must be to be like a huge star somewhere. And so that was the first time it made me realise this is quite big in the Doctor Who world. Up until then... I'd just been, it just been a lovely job that I, and I, I still think it is actually a lovely job that I adore doing. I just, I love Charlie. I, I sort of feel completely at home in her shoes and I don't really need to do anything to be her. But although she is very different to me, actually, I don't think she's, um, she's much, much nicer than I am. <laughs> she's much more open to new ideas and she's less she's not cynical and she's you know full of life and energy and uh she's just great fun to play and I've been really lucky with the writing the writing has always been superb there's never been a script never ever in the 20 odd years that I've gone "Mm, no that's not Charlie that doesn't sound right everyone has always got her so I'm very lucky with that it's interesting you mentioned the writing because I was a bit late to Big Finish, but my very first 
big finish story was the chimes of midnight. So, oh, and those those were the days start, when you go to someone's house and they they were in you know the CDs were in the bookshelf. Yeah. Someone handed it to me and said, "Listen to this; it'll blow your mind." It did, and uh, yeah. I was I was hooked on Big Finish ever since then. Oh. And uh, we we spoke to Rob Sherman a little while ago about that script too. Uh, it was a it was a pretty amazing script to actually because you had a big arc in that script too. It was all all the stories were kind of tied in together too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so thank you for that. And and the Chimes of Midnight is still regarded as probably in the top, be top five, would you say, Philip? Of uh, I think it's best still big, top. I think it's, I think it's still top one. I when, think when yeah. it, it's still really? voted. No, it's still voted number it's still one. Voted number yeah. one in terms of the best, I mean, it's best my favorite. Ever. And it's, yeah, it's a great it's, one, though, isn't it? And it's Christmassy, and it's sort of spooky. It's sort of everything. Rob is such a such a good writer, and it's sort of everything you want from a. I did a. They did a they did a sort of I did a Twitter feed thing so sort of probably last year now where they they did a live uh, recording of it and then well they did a live sort of airing of it and then I was so it was a uh, listen along so, type thing a yeah, listen along type live tweet along yes, exactly. yeah tweet along yeah and uh, and actually I was uh, my uh, my husband listened to it for the first time sort of next to me because he came in going what are you doing and uh, and he was like, he was blown away and it is it's a re- you forget it's a really good classically told sort of slightly scary slightly Christmassy brilliant story. Mm. We were fortunate we um, spoke to Robert Kirbishley, Gr- Leonard Greaves, and Sue Wallace um, all together oh, wow. about, about yeah. the episode for its 20th anniversary a couple of years ago. Um, oh, wow. And it was just, they were so they were still so excited by it and still amused and surprised that 20 years on, people wanted to talk to them about it. And I know that when I sort of tracked yeah. them down, they're sort of saying, are you serious? You really want to talk to us about this? But yeah. their energy <laughs> and excitement about just being able to discuss something that yeah, has had such a huge impact. It's, it's it's yeah. In terms of big Finnish fans, it's usually number one of everyone who oh, says well, yeah. It's it's that's the best, lovely. the best. Yeah, and it was that time again. It was the time where we were all playing different. Well, not me, but they were all playing different parts yes. in the other in the other stories. And so it was. We had a lovely week, and it is that thing of you get to you get to know the people you're acting with, and that has a real effect on how you feel about about the work and the job the sad thing now is that quite a lot of it is done remotely and you don't get to see people you know I've done I did some because Big Finish didn't drop a step did they in COVID they just carried straight on they were (laughs) extraordinary and so I did some during COVID where you were actually working with the same people for the same length of time you did a full week but um, because you weren't seeing their faces you didn't have that same connection. And, you know, after the first day, I had to go and Google people to put faces to the names because that's really sad. And luckily that's stopping. We are getting back in studio now. And I do always, if we um, if we record something, I do always go, can I go into studio, please? A, because well, it means I get out of my box. You know? I don't know the Colin, <laughs> Colin, like Colin, Baker, <laughs> Colin Baker always insisted the first half an hour was spent on Zoom. Where he could actually see everyone and talk to people because he felt ah. he couldn't give a good enough performance that he'd actually eyed everyone, you know, eyeballed everyone, talked to everyone, nice. introduced himself. So that's good. It, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, Colin's rule. That. Yeah. Hmm. That makes sense. I'm sure, the directors are itching. Now, it, it was 10 months between doing that first block of four and then the next block of, was it six or eight in the second season? I forget how many. Six. Six. Was it six? Um, yeah. So, as I said, I mean, Dwayne made the point that for us Doctor Who fans, we very much view this as the continuing series of Doctor Who um, yeah. because it had been off the air. Paul McGann was back. He was the current Doctor. And we were taking it very and, – and Big Finch were taking it so seriously in terms of writing so well. Um, yeah. Did you pay much attention to the fan reaction that was coming out after that first season or particularly the second one? Uh, not a huge amount. I mean, obviously, I mean – uh, yeah, obviously, I was aware that it was it was it was being received well, and people were liking Charlie, which was great. And but I sort of thought, well, what's not to like? Do you know what I mean? She's she's lovely. She's it's nothing to do. With, I always think people go, oh, well, we love Charlie, and I'm like, yeah, so do I. It's nothing to do. I feel it's I feel that she sort of inhabits me rather than it's anything to do with me. If you know what I mean, it, which is very strange to say as an actor, you know. But I'm definitely not saying, oh yes, it's my 
extraordinary performance as Charlie that makes her so amazing. It's not. It's the it's the writing and it's it's who she is. And it is your um, performance as well. Well, that's very kind of you. But um, as I say, I don't feel I'm performing. I just sort of feel as though I'm saying the words for for her. She's very very in me now, which sounds weird, but yeah. <laughs> Now, in some ways, the writing pushed the Doctor and Charlie together in a way the new series would later do with the Rose, Rose and the Doctor. But in terms mm-hmm. of a companion falling in love with the Doctor um, and, and, and exploring uh, yeah, those see. areas. Yeah, I have I have issues about this, you see. I, so, I, so, so I, us, yeah. Right, so my, my view on it is that she's not romantically in love with him in the idea that you know she doesn't want to have a relation well it's it's the idea that you re- you have to remember that she was very young 16 meant to be when she first ran away from home and so he is he is everything to her so it's this weird so he's family he's yeah father figure he's he's yeah, sort of obviously male companion but i don't think I don't think she wants, you know, I don't, when people went, people got very upset about Scherzo, didn't they? And like, you know, sort of going, oh, you know, they kissed and they're not meant to kiss. And it's all like, I don't think she wanted to sleep with him. My view is she doesn't want to sleep with him. She doesn't want a relationship with him. But he is, she is oh. utterly in love with him. She, because she is, he is everything to her. And she has no, she has no one else. And, you know, obviously in later stories, we come back and we get Annika Wilson's My Lovely Mum and things like that. Uh, but, you know, she doesn't, she ran away and she is with this man and that is it. It is just the two of them together. And so I really loved the bit in Scherzo where they sort of melded because that to me was what was happening especially for Charlie, I think, way more than for the Doctor because, of course, the Doctor's had multiple companions and will have multiple companions and you know so for him he's got a much uh more sort of you know backward view or sort of stepped away from view whereas charlie this this man is her world and so that's how i took it so i didn't take it the fact that she's like you know she's not in love with him in love with him but she loves him Skirto was written on rob's honeymoon though he wrote that while he was on his honeymoon (laughs) <laughs> I know, I know, the amazing Janie. Thank you so much for, <laughs> for putting up with your husband writing a writing a script on your honeymoon. Yeah, yeah. And he said he wrote it as a thank you for Chimes of Midnight. And so you go, we should be thanking you, you know, for Chimes of Midnight. So yeah, no, it's extraordinary. I love, I loved it, and I loved performing that. That was an amazing uh, experience because it was just Paul and I. They put two music stands with our microphones facing one another and we did it as live so we started it and we performed it as you would uh you know a stage play and so that was extraordinary so all of the heightened emotions became you built up whereas you know when you're sort of going off to the green room coming back having a cup of tea suddenly going oh yeah hang on i'm just eating my biscuit wait i'll come back you know you're not sort of in it as much as um when you're actually performing it like a like a live piece of theatre. So that was an extraordinary, and I loved Gary for doing that. That was great. Doctor Who, Scherzo. I'm sorry, it occurs to me since I'm hiding here from so many nothings and somethings, I don't yet know whether I should be hiding from you as well. Who are you? Doctor Who. You know me, I'm Charlie. Charlie? Yes. You remember? Rubbish. What? Charlie's safe, I know she is. It's me, Doctor. No, Please. Charlie wouldn't betray me. She wouldn't betray me like that. Ugh. Doctor! Help! Doctor, it's trying to speak. Impossible. It's barely evolved a rudimentary nervous system, let alone a means to master conversation. Help! What are you? We want to help. Help! Yes, yes, we'll do our best help, to... Help. Doctor? I don't know. Doctor? Yes, very good. That's quite enough. You're scaring Charlie. You're scaring me, come for that. Please, stop! 
just out of curiosity, have you heard the the finished product of Skirtso? Yeah, 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 yeah. I listen to it because with all. the sound design, it's one of also one of the scariest uh, stories I've ever heard too. The way they yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, I think I think it's an underrated. I think people people were very sort of like it was very marmite, wasn't it? Or <laughs> vegemite? Does that does that work? Do people love it or works. hate vegemite work. the same way they love or hate like marmite? <laughs> Most of our listeners uh, in the UK, so it's fine. Oh well, there you go. Yeah, very marmite moment. You know, people. People uh, like you know, sort of people have big reactions to it, and I actually thought it was a beautiful piece of work. But I mean, there's a whole series. I mean, you've come up with some huge, huge, epic part pieces like Neverland and the Zagreus, which also confused people. Into Scherzo, which was this amazing two-hander, unbelievably experimental. Um, yeah. I guess as an actress, was moving from that sort of place to place a really fulfilling thing. Yeah, I mean, they, I've, the Big Finish have given me some amazing things to do over the years, and I've been incredibly lucky. Um, yeah, I loved, I loved Neverland was was really was really important to me, and um, and I loved playing uh, Anti Charlie. Although um, Nick used to rip the piss out of me for or take the Mickey, should I say? Because uh, I didn't realise when I was doing the anti charlie lines i stood with my hands on my hips i can't do it now because i'm in a cupboard but and he said do you realize you're doing that and i said no what what am i doing but i sort of had to make a different uh, stance because i there was quite a lot of time where i was genuinely talking to myself and they said do you want to do you want to do all your charlie lines then all your anti charlie lines and i said no 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 that 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 won't work for me i don't i'm, I'm going to have to I'm having a conversation, so I need to have the conversation. So, yes, I was just talking to myself for quite a long period of time. But one of the best compliments came from Neverland. Uh, Mark Gatiss texted me and said, uh, he said, I've just finished Neverland and I burst into floods of tears. You made me cry. And I was like, get in. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so the physicality is, is very important. You said you set your hands on your hips to get that voice. Yeah. So um, yeah. is, that is that, a, that an extra that benefit of the studio? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I haven't heard that in a while, so it probably doesn't sound any different. But for me, to in my head, to be the different character, I had to do something physical, but I didn't realise I was doing it. So it was it was completely uh, subconscious until Nick charmingly pointed it out to me. And then, of course, then of course, every time I did it, I realised I was doing it. Uh, but yeah, physicality is is important. And as I said, I didn't realise how physical you could be on audio um, and how you weren't going to affect the microphone and how important it was. And, uh, you know, Jason, actually, I've done a couple of um, with tomorrow people where, where he had me crawling, crawling on my hands and knees because we were crawling through a, crawling through a tunnel in the, uh, in, in the recording. And we were actually all on our hands and knees in the studio. I think there's a terrible photo where you can see down my top. Talk about playing other characters. You got in Gallifrey, um, a blind eye. You got to play Charlie's uh, sister, um, oh, yeah. Celia, yeah. who was a very unusual character, a Nazi. Um, I was yeah. Just how, how did it change yeah. in terms of playing that sort of character go? What was it like? Well, I quite liked. I liked her because, well, obviously not liked her. You know, she's. <laughs> you can like someone without agreeing with their political uh, views, but it was it was like playing a Mitford sister that I quite liked her just sort of absolute disregard for everything that we hold dear to ourselves, and so it's quite freeing that I like I like I like being able to break away from Charlie a little bit, much as I love Charlie, I would quite like to be able to do different things. Bit of a um, interesting circle too, because. With Zagreus, that's where Louise Jamison and Lala Ward first came together and they worked out they could be a really fantastic series in Gallifrey. Um, ah, and, of course, yeah. it was your interaction with them and a lot of the scenes you played with them that made that work so well. And then you're yeah. brought back a couple of years later into Gallifrey. Yeah. <laughs> yes, playing Queen Anne, was I? Oh, that's, that, I was saying, was silly. Oh, was it when we were, so we're talking about Gallifrey something different now. Oh no no no! You were you. You're probably right. I'm always wrong. I'm always wrong. We've done so many. I don't <laughs> I was, I was even know Celia, how many. I was Celia Pollard in was, in Gallifrey. Was Celia Pollard in Gallifrey as well? Okay, well then no no. Queen Anne must have been in. Uh, was that the Invasion of Arthur Luke Rice? People. Oh, that was oh. Luther Arkwright. There you go. You see. <laughs> oh. You've got no idea what you've done. You've done so much. Honestly, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid to say, yeah, they um, yes, uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I, they're, they're so brilliant together as well, aren't they? I mean, they're just... And Zagreus was an extraordinary thing. And I felt slightly... I felt like sort of honoured, but also slightly amazed that sort of Charlie was the thread that held this behemoth together. And uh, I got to work with everyone, basically. It was amazing. It's the first time I'd worked with Syl Sylvester and people like that. So I'd I'd seen him at conventions, but we'd never actually worked together. And so that was, it was really, it was lovely to do. I don't know whether people were a bit bamboozled by it to listen to. I mean, how long is it actually? I don't know. It's three discs. Four, no, it's four hours because it uses all the space on the CD for every disc. So yeah, an hour and 20 minutes each CD. <laughs> That's a commitment, isn't it? I mean, four hours, yeah. that is, yeah. I've got four hours to spend. Although, actually, you now look at films. No film is less than three hours now, are they? It's like, what, But it, it kind of carries on. Neverland carries on into Zagreus. So if you include that too, there's six hours there. <laughs> yeah. Probably more. Neverland's a long two hours too. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a long two mad. hours. Feels like a long two hours. Is that what you're saying, Philip? <laughs> <laughs> So more than two hours, really what me to say. Really drags. By the end, you're just like, oh, <laughs> die already. <laughs> no, actually, I never feel like it. Never I never feel like that because there's just so much happening. Um, I know. And, and we, we actually just listen to the grace because we've been doing a series on um, all the anniversary stories. Um, oh, and, wow. you know, and so having people, so Gary came and talked to us about the grace and behind the writing behind it all and, and things. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, he, just, he talks about the fact that the fans hated it. But I've always actually enjoyed it in terms of giving the actors the different different options, different things to do, um, which oh, we well, discussed along the way. I just wanted to jump on, um, you mentioned Luther Arkwright. So the star of that was David Tennant. Um, mm -hmm. Did you work with him in studio for that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so did that's, you get a sense that's... that he was, a, that was before he became really, really that big. Was, so, so did you get a sense of where before. he was going? Well, actually, interestingly enough, um, that... <laughs> <laughs> that will always stick in my memory, not for the first time of meeting David Tennant, obviously that as well, but I had the worst food poisoning the night before. So I was basically up all night with food poisoning and we don't need to go into the ins and outs of that, but you know what that's like. And I dragged Save that for a myself. podcast. Yeah, 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 exactly. I dragged myself to the studio and uh, I remember him saying I was just lying on a sofa like this, going, oh, because of course with, you know, with an actor, you can't phone in sick can't say I'm sorry I'm not getting out of bed today and um, and I was also in my 20s so I was fine and um, and he said to me you should have a full fat coke that's the best thing to do and it did it got me through the day but um, I then invited him to my 30th birthday party because we'd done that together and he came and he just started filming a Casanova and I remember him saying, oh, I've just, I'm just filming this thing called Casanova. And then it just like, and then he blew up, didn't he? And it was like, you know, extraordinary. But yeah, he is a, an amazing actor. And I, just before doing that performance with him, I'd seen him in The Pillow Man at the National and yeah. still sticks with me as one of the most extraordinary performances I've ever seen of anyone. He acted Jim Broadbent off the stage and that's a, pretty big mm. ask because Jim Broadbent's amazing too and uh, yeah so that was, I've, I've been very lucky with the quality of actors that Big Finish has thrown my way You didn't plan to invite him to your 40th birthday as well? Oh yeah no 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 by, by, the, by the time 40th I'd had kids so I made my own birthday cake at my 40th birthday and basically <laughs> had like a sort of slight barbecue there's the difference yeah <laughs> 50th next year you never know might yeah <laughs> that'd be good um well, at the same time as you do all this doctor who stuff with the big finish it's it's sort of you know a week here then 10 months of nothing then two weeks then yeah. so it's, it's, a, it's a bizarre as much as you know we're getting you every month it feels like you must be working all the time it's fairly small yeah. periods of intense work oh yeah yeah and 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 like there were, there were, I think there was a sort of two year period where I didn't do anything for Big Finish. I mean, and yeah. so I thought, oh right, that that's it. And then suddenly they've done a little, a little flurry again last, you know, this year. I've had sort of quite a few, which was uh, which was really nice, and mm. um, some yeah, some like you know exciting new ones, which obviously we can't talk about, about. Um, which is fine because I can't remember them. Remember them anyway. <laughs> so what was happening with the rescue career outside of Big Finish? Oh well, yeah. So I uh, I narrate a um, a cookery program in England called MasterChef, 
And so that's so you are, you are, you are that's, the vo- you are the voice of Master Chef and have been for fifteen the, years, twenty years. How long for? No, longer than that. There, yeah, I'm just about to because I thought Big Finish. I knew that Big Finish. We did the twentieth anniversary. Was it last year? Year before? Can't quite remember. And um, my it's going to be on my gravestone. Isn't it? That would have Can't been four years ago now. No, was it because the years Big ago? Finish? Well, Big Finish. Uh, sta- well, Big Finish actually started in ninety eight. Yeah, with yeah. the Bennies. First one I did for them. Yeah, um, but so I knew that Big Finish had gone on for twenty years, and I thought, well, you know, how lucky am I? And then actually, Master Chef, for though I'm about to record on Thursday, um, a twentieth anniversary special for them. So that's been twenty years as well. So I don't have many jobs, but the jobs I do have carry on. She says, touching all wood. <laughs> is, but yeah, is Master, so I, I, I'm just curious yeah. about MasterChef. We, we we have our Australian version as well. Um, is is it a very intense job as well? Like, do they record everything, edit everything, and then you just do the narration on top in a short period of time? Yeah, or? yeah. You're the you're the final cog in the machine. So they've recorded it all, they've filmed it all, they've edited it all. So they know that you've got seven seconds to say the dish description. But our MasterChef is a lot less intense than Australian MasterChef, I think, in terms of, I think Australian MasterChef is much more like, oh, come on, get it on. Whereas ours is a bit more sort of, um, I mean, it is quite, it is quite stressful. Not for me, for the people doing it. Like, it's very, <laughs> it's very nice for me. I sit, that's uh, <laughs> why I created this booth so that I could carry on doing, uh, doing MasterChef. So I sit in my cupboard now. The last three series of MasterChef, everyone, has been brought to you from the delights of this cupboard. And um, yeah, I just get very hungry because I don't ever get to eat it. Because I just, I look at it like on a Zoom. So I look at it as you would the, the TV program. And uh, and I just say the words over it. Some sometimes I have to look at the same bit again and again and again when I get the words wrong. But there are other bits where I just don't see. I don't see. I never see a full episode because we just record over the bits that I speak over. So have you ever been on set and met people? On you never. No. Well, I mean, I've met people. So I've met John and Greg in again early on. So it'll be very nice to see them. I'm going. So on on Thursday, day after tomorrow, I am actually going on set. And um, uh, it's a big gala dinner. It'd be nice. When is this coming out, by the way? Maybe I shouldn't. Be uh, not for, this not for a while. Though. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> probably be done. Uh, and um, yeah, so I I did know them. I have met them. But John always used to laugh at me because me being me, I used to go up to him and say, "Oh hi, John. I'm I'm India. I do the voice." He was like, "I know who you are, India. I know who you are. We've met enough times. You don't need to keep introducing yourself to me." But yeah, so um, but I never, I never get to be in studio when they're when they're recording it. Friends of mine used to think I sort of sat behind with a sort of you know commentators microphones and behind the desk, going with a minute to go. She's burnt her muffins. But no, I'm I'm in a darkened room somewhere else. So how long does it take to record a series of MasterChef? Uh, well, we do it. We probably do three episodes in a session, and depending on the length of episode, uh, it can it's a sort of three hour session. So, but I have got quicker over the years. It used to be much longer sessions. I would do sort of one, one episode, um, and in a big session. Um, but obviously, there are so many things that just now just trip out of my tongue. I know, I know how to say it. I've said it for twenty years. So, uh, yeah, it's it's become a quicker become a quicker thing but that again is because I do the amateur one and I do the celeb one so that only happens half half of the year really we start recording for the amateur one in January and that goes till sort of March and then there's a tiny gap and then sort of I carry on for celeb until June July so this this part of the year sort of November time autumn that I'm, I'm not doing any master chef so it's it's strange, you know. You have these peaks and troughs with work. Because you're so well known as a voice artist, have you did was that a struggle to get stage work or other work that you might have wanted to do? Yeah, I sort of gave up with stage work really because of having kids. Stage work for me and children didn't really mix. I know people do do it, and I'm hats off to them. But um, I didn't want to be sort of touring for six months or, you know, in the, in like, you know, in, in the theatre every night. Um, so I, I sort of 
slowly and not massively intentionally, but it just sort of happened that actually voice work fitted better around my family life. And so I've just concentrated on voice work, really. And you're content with voice work? I am. I really like it. I really like it. I mean, you know, obviously part of me, the reason I became an actor is because I love standing on stage, but um, I wasn't you know, <laughs> I wasn't getting the work. So I get much better quality voice work and uh, and I do enjoy it. And I find, you know, it's 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 quite easy, isn't it? You know, you just read a script. People tell me off for saying, you know, a seven year old could do my job. It's like if you can read aloud for a living, then you can read aloud. <laughs> no, it's it's far more complex than that. So I don't, <laughs> believe that, don't believe that. For instance, now in terms of, I mean, back back in Big Finish, so you, you're doing these scripts. You're now starting to do conventions around the world. Where, where have you been? Where have you travelled to, as Charlie? Well, as uh, so I've done Australia, and, uh, and we I loved did... you here. <laughs> yeah, well, I loved it. If, if anyone wants to invite me back, um, uh, well, we'll, I, we'll, talk, we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I've done um, I've done America a few times, so I've done Chicago and LA, and um, and then sort of various English ones. But I don't do that many conventions actually. I um, I think I did a lot when Charlie was first out, but then when it came Doctor Who came back on the telly. I think they had, you know, bigger telly fish to fry, really. So uh, I don't do that many conventions, but it's nice when I do. What, what's what's some of the fan experiences like? How do they react to you? Oh, they're lovely, always. I've never, ever met a nasty Doctor Who fan or, uh, like, you know, someone I wasn't happy to chat to for ages. No, always really lovely. And they're all, everyone seems to have such a, a fondness for Charlie, which obviously equates to a fondness for me, you know, because they they see me as as Charlie. So that's that's very nice. <laughs> Who doesn't like meeting people that go, oh, I love you. You're great. It's like, oh, thanks. Thanks. That's very kind. I'm sure you're lovely, too. <laughs> well, you become an actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's one thing I do enjoy about the voiceover, because you can you can carry on because you're sort of slightly anonymous. So you can carry on being normal. I don't think I could I couldn't cope with actual, you know, Fame, fame. That would be very difficult. So after Shirt So, Doctor Who takes you into the Divergent universe um, and you yeah. start working with Conrad Westmass as well. Yeah. Um, what, yeah. what was it like in terms of that whole experience of you know, moving to a, a different universe, different, very different way of telling stories? Well, Conrad was just the loveliest, is just the loveliest man I know. And so working with him was a joy. But I have to say the Divergent universe... It was a little bit odd, and I feel poor Conrad got a lot of stick for the Divergent universe because it sort of went as if everyone was on this high of Doctor and the Charlie, and then it went, oh, now there's a sort of weird alien gooseberry, and we're not we're in in a era where there's no time, and how does that work for a Time Lord? And um, you know, Conrad and I laugh about the fact we used to laugh a lot about the fact that um, he was a character who was changed color with his mood he was a sort of chameleon we were going but that that, that doesn't work on audio does it so in in the uh in getting back to with Nell and i we always used to go he's so moo but um <laughs> yeah no comrade is a, a brilliant actor and uh i think i think people will look back on keres and that's the other thing as well no one can pronounce his name was it chris keres keres um and see that actually it was a it was a it was a great character, and I liked the fact that we were a threesome. And actually, I think they've done that more moving forward now. I think mm. there's more sort of two companions. Well, there were obviously always were two companions with the Doctor, but um, I think it's sort of I think it's I think it worked, and um, I just think poor Connie got a bit of stick for the Divergent universe, really. Doctor Who, Faith Stealer. Do your religions require ritual sacrifice, the drinking of blood, or any special diet? No. Carter, come on. A joke's a joke. Where are you? Where am I? Uh, hello? What is it? 
Are any of you carrying gods about your person? Uh, no, I, I wonder, is all this uh, strictly de rigueur? I mean, couldn't we just pop inside and do the form filling some other time? Your faith and religious details must be recorded before you may enter the multi heaven. Please, Bishop Parash, you must not struggle. You're, you're in my mind. The less you fight it, the better it feels. What? What are you? I am Miraculite, and all shall live in me. Charlie and I are members of the tourist faith. We worship Keris here, and we begin each day with a ritual cup of tea. Your god's looking rather faint. Oh, God. Oh, Keris. What have they made you into? Kill me, please! All right. <laughs> Goodbye, my love. <laughs> this has to be. <laughs> There are still some amazing, great stories in that Divergent Universe arc. Um, I mean, the Faith Stealer is probably one of the ones that stands out to me, just the co- pure comedy oh, yeah. of the Faith Stealer. Um, you know, and John Dorney acting in that, along with others and all those sort of things. Um, but this is just decided to bring you back early because of the, this TV show starting and people thinking, you know, Doctor fan, new fans come to Big Finish that have no idea what's going on. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, Big Finish have gone a little bit off piste, and uh, yeah, Doctor Who fans are like, "What? Hang on." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so you brought back to the back to the proper universe. Um, was mm-hmm. it, once again though, yeah, they're, they're being recorded lots of just blocks again, and then a block, and then no work for yes. twelve months. Yeah, probably. They may have started to do two and two. We certainly didn't start. We didn't do the thing of having a company all together because we were back in London by then. And so we weren't recording as a, you know, as a sort of theatre company like we had been when we were in Bristol. And so it did feel a bit more sort of sporadic and as if they were standard, you recorded standalone stories. You might have done two at a time, done two days work, but then, yeah, so it's always been piecemeal. It's always been little bits here and there. And the decision was then to move you away from Paul um, and, you know, take you away and then put you with Colin Baker. Did you yeah. have any say in that? Did you know it was going to happen? How did, how did it all come about? No, I didn't. Um, I didn't know it was going to happen. I didn't know. Um, I certainly didn't have any say in it. And uh, But I was very, very happy. And I, I always wait for Charlie to be killed off, really. I sort of feel as though, you know, every script says, oh, well, she's creating this time paradox and it's all, and you think, mm, they're going to have to get rid of us soon. And so when the end of Paul happened, I thought, oh, well, you know, okay, fair enough. They've decided to kill her off. And then it was very nice when um, when the TARDIS dematerial, you hear the dematerialization and it's like, oh, that's not who I was thinking of. And um, and so I liked, and working with Colin, Colin's an absolute angel of a man. I love him to bits and we get on incredibly well. And so I always love working with Colin. I'd love to do more with Colin. Yeah, the original plan, I think, was just to have three stories with him. But my understanding right. is the two of you got on so well, they went, oh, we'll keep giving you more and more. So in the oh, end, well, there you go. See, I'm, I'm... 12... I, say, I think you did 12 stories in the end with him. Did we do 12? There you go. <laughs> you see, well, I, I thought yeah. it was nine, but still it was a lot more than three. Either so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I, uh, Colin and I are both hilarious pedants. I love I love Colin for his, like, you know, he, he cares about the script and I care about the script and he cares about um, pronunciation and things like that. And there was a, there's a wonderful Colin. He was telling a story where he said, uh, they used to have a, a telephone line. BBC used to have a telephone line that you could ring up and check pronunciations of things. And he said, so I rang this line one time and um, <clears throat> someone answered the phone and said, hello, pronunciation. And he went, you can't help me and put the phone down because <laughs> she'd pronounced it wrong. <laughs> 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 and I just love that. <laughs> he really makes me laugh. And um and I love the I love the uh, you know sixth Doctor and Charlie energy. And I liked what I liked was that Charlie became more grown up, 
and it sort of she had this more worldly wise, which was which was helpful because I was in my you know late thirties by then. So um, I felt that she was sort of growing with me a bit more, and she had this secret that she was keeping from the doctor. She thought she knew more than he did, and and I loved that. That was a really nice character development for Charlie. The idea that she she was protecting the doctor now. It sort of changed the dynamic in her head. Didn't change the dynamic in the doctor's head, of course. And obviously she doesn't realise, she thinks she's seen him die in the future. And so she thinks she's, you know, doing a very wonderful thing. And then there's always the bit where she leaves him and sort of, you know, wipes herself from his memory and things like that. Um, so I loved all of that. It was great to, great to sort of feel that Charlie was growing a bit. And there's still no official news as to the exact nature of the police operation yesterday at Ackley House. Hello? Oh, ah, uh, hello. I, I was wondering if that you'd mind... That fell Um... Is he dead? Ah, uh, yes. I'm Charlie. What are you shouting for? Well, I appear to be handcuffed to this bed. Oh, yeah. He was strangled, and now he's dead. All very straightforward. Oh, let's see what we can do about that. No, she's still out of it. What if she doesn't come round? Mr. Slater. You see, I've been very worried about something. I've been worried about you talking. D.I. Menzies, isn't your solicitor here yet? No, I don't need one. Yeah, the money's plenty. I just don't want to hear too long, that's all. There are two ways you can react to this. You can lock me away and pretend it's all nonsense and go back to your life. Or you can let me help you solve it. My name's Charlie. My name's Sam. Please don't hang up. I've just been calling all over the building. People keep hanging up on me. They think I'm messing about. Help me. What is it? What's wrong? The local residents' association is reporting an abnormally high incidence of electrical and telephone line faults. I was expecting someone else. Someone else? So the character was so successful, she went on then to have her own series or two, and there should be three. Um, yeah. How, do you know how, how it came about that they decided? So, I mean, it's a very rare thing for any Doctor Who companion ever to get their own series. And so Charlie well, now has we... had two box sets with a third we're still being promised. Um, oh, really, are we? Oh, you see, I, I never know. You see, I'm, I'm told <laughs> you probably know more than me. Uh, yeah, that was that was amazing. That was That was very... Flattering when they came and said, with well, Nick said, I'm going to write, I'm going to write a Charlie box set. And I said, Really? And I said, You know, do I get a companion then? <laughs> so, uh, but that's, and James, James Joyce, great name, uh, is, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful person to like, you know, sort of play off. And, and I love, I love their relationship. And, and that, now that you see, I will admit that that is a, that is a slightly more, nuanced i'm not I don't i very rarely say the word sexual with charlie i don't think she's very like that way inclined but she's definitely she's definitely sort of growing up in terms of how she feels about robert bucken robert bucken, bucken. there bucken. we go i always it's just james to me yeah so i love that and i love i think the stories they've given charlie are some of them are brilliant and and i like the fact that it's not sort of Doctor Who light. That's what I was very concerned. I said, I don't want her to just sort of be, a, you know, a time traveling thing going round. So I like the fact that it feels, it feels its own thing. I don't know. What do you think of it? Do you like it? Well, it's, it, once again, it was interesting because box set one, box set two are totally different. Like yeah. the, the whole, I mean, box set one is four traditional stories, lots of humor, lighthearted, yeah. Charlie being very Charlie. Then the second box set is very strongly linked. Well, it's really with just one story, um, yeah. a bit darker. Um, yeah. Very different. Like, and I, I mean, I'm, it's good that they're so different. Crazy flying ants and things like that. You know? yeah, but it really is just this sort of, whoa, they've, they've, what they've done is just you know, a major change with these two box sets, but still keeping yeah. the essence of Charlie there. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wonder what Nick's going to do with it. It just sort of depends on what <laughs> Nick fancies <laughs> doing, really. Yeah, Nick, 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 Nick just has never has time to finish anything. And it's yes, like, oh, he just I, has I, to I, have I, time to write it, and then he'll do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, <laughs> he's yeah. always got so many things hanging <laughs> over his head. Yeah, exactly. He takes on too much. Yeah. Um, we talked also about the companion chronicle you did called Solitaire, written by John oh, yes. Dorney. So I'm yeah, sure we, yeah. 
remember that, but once it was just a two hander with with um Bailey, David Bailey, oh, David Bailey, David Bailey, yes, 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 as the master, but the toy maker, the toy maker, toy maker, toy maker. Toy he's coming maker. back, he's coming back in a couple of weeks' time, played by Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, right, and the, the new, uh, se- no, the new series would... is bringing back the toy maker. Oh, really? Oh, brilliant. Mm. No, that was a great. And I, uh, John Dorney's such a such a good writer. I mean, Big Finish have just got some real cracking writers. And mm. and they do it for the love of Doctor Who, don't they? And uh, and yeah, so John's written some great, great scripts for me. And uh, and again, he's someone that just sort of completely gets the Charlie voice. And it's really easy to, you know, do his stuff. But yeah, David Bailey it was good. It was nice, and then that brilliant cover where it's got Paul as a as a ventriloquist doll yeah. on on him. But, on but Japan was really made. That's a real doll. Really? Yeah. There you go. The, the, the Imagine times they splice the times they splice my head onto some random male body, and yet they make the doll. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> So Charlie's been coming back in lots of different bits and pieces at the moment. She came back for the 50th anniversary of Light at the End. Um, yeah. You know, when it came time to pair up Paul with his, you know, the most obvious companion was you. Um, <laughs> what, what's it like in terms of bouncing back and forwards now in terms of, you know, bits and pieces? You also had that lovely box set for the um, Further Adventurous, which was a beautiful yeah. box set of stories. I mean, there were just four brilliant stories. Um, what's it like popping back and forward now as Charlie? Well, it's lovely. As I say, I always, I'm always thrilled when I get a uh, you know chance to play Charlie again. And sometimes it's quite funny. They sort of go, "Oh, well, now this is this is pre that story." So, and you sort of go, "Right, so I I need to sound nineteen, do I? Okay, <laughs> right. Thank God it's audio. It's like <laughs> the only only on audio could I get away with playing a nineteen year old. But um, uh, no, it's she's always she's always a joy and. They're just, you know, the scripts are so good and the stories are great and it's just nice to be able to go and sit in her, you know, comfy clothes again and and be Charlie. So I'm always thrilled when someone says, do you want to come play Charlie? Yes, please. Don't care where she is. Don't care what story arc she's on or, yeah, she's so... She's so part of me that I don't have to I don't have to worry about any of that and sort of think, oh, hang on, where is she now? Who's she with? What's she doing? It's just let's just go. Let's do it. Now you talked about your love of putting on voices. You actually got to do that in a Sherlock Holmes recently with the seamstress of Peckham Rye. Uh, oh, yeah. so much so that I actually didn't even realise you were in it. And oh. I went to the cast list at the end and went India Fisher and I had to go back and work out who you were because I had totally oh. missed you. Oh, thank you. That's good. Yeah, no, I'd la- that was really nice. That was um, that was Ken allowing me, Ken Bentley allowing me to do other things. He was like, "Yeah, you went. How do you feel?" I was like, "Yes, please. I'll play some different things. It's nice. It's good to um, stretch your uh, like you know, acting chops for a bit." Now, as I mentioned, I'm listening to the new Doctor Who companion. You know, they've put Paul again back in time a bit. And he, yes. you know, we, there was a whole big thing made about his new companion, um, Audacity. But then at the yes. end of the box set, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, um, yeah. Charlie, he, he goes back to pick up Charlie that he's left behind. Um, I know. So can you give us any clues in terms of what to expect with future Charlie? Well, uh, no, probably not. But I can tell you that uh, Jay and I got on incredibly well like incredibly well and if 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 anything is pre- if anything that big finish do is to go by then you said you know oh well they were only going to do three st- uh, stories with colin but we got on really well so they carried on uh yeah audacity and i audacity and charlie were uh forced to be reckoned with let's put that when we were very very vocal about the fact that we want more of this we were like this is good we like this this works so um if if we've got any say in it then hopefully there'll be more audacity and charlie because um it worked and it was great fun poor paul don't think don't think the doctor knew what what hit him? It was like two very, uh, yeah, bossy middle class women having a go at him from either side. I mean, we thought it worked brilliantly. I mean, <laughs> so, Jake Griffiths is, is an amazing actress. 
And um, oh. you know, she, she she really, I think in that box that she really established herself well already in terms of who she could be and the, the character she was. And so yeah. the, those little scenes at the end with the two of you, I was thinking this is going to be really good. So don't know when the don't know when we're hearing from you next, or when it's going to be no announcements. They know it's the same thing. You know, they sort of they go. Mm. David Richardson came up and went, mm, quite liking this this little U two is very good, and we were like, yes, 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 please, that would be great. More of this, please. So we'll let, yeah, fingers crossed that. But as you say, it's uh, you know, it's just that thing of oh, someone's got to write it. <laughs> so you you know, someone has to find the time. Hmm? Yeah, the, the the next box is is out. Well, by the time this is released, it it will be this month. Yeah, it's December. Oh really? Oh really? Oh, okay, really? I haven't seen it. I haven't been looking ahead in the schedule. I I'm not coping with things at the moment. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, it's not my fault. <laughs> so what's Actually, it called? Yes, it is. Uh, something about Christmas. I there can't remember what it's called. It's it's, it's, got, it's, a, it's got a Christmas it's, theme. They're not they're not listing it under India still. So the the last thing under India is Doomsday. And they're not mentioning oh, Audacity or the new production as India. They're still keeping. Well, it's still a, still a spoiler at the I moment. Think, so sorry, think, everyone. Yeah, spoiler that... still. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry, everyone. But yeah, yeah. Hopefully they'll. Um, I would love it if there were more Charlie and Audacity. That would be. I thought that was a that was a match made in heaven, as far as I was concerned. Great fun. Ah, uh, it's not. It's not Christmas. It, it is a Christmas theme, but it's called um, In the Bleak Midwinter. Ah, I did think it. I was thinking it wasn't. Yeah, I was. Uh, I thought God, but you know me, my memory. I thought I don't remember it being Christmas. It's got Santa Claus yes. on the cover. That's why I was thinking Christmas. Oh, was it got? <laughs> well, there you go. It's coming out. That's December. probably that's probably where they'll take the Santa Claus off and put Charlie on. I bet you that's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you. No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't know whether uh, I'll be. I'll be on the cover of that. I don't know. Who knows? We'll I'm never. I'm yeah, never. The covers are completely. I'm, I never pose for any any cover photos. They just take sort of photos from me from various different uh, things, and as I say, splice them onto the <laughs> the bodies of other people. I once had an Adam's apple. I remember, thanks to Clay Hickman, I, he said <laughs> he said if you looked at that, I'd put you on a boy's uh, like yeah, and think it was Storm Morning actually. So I think it was a boy's um, you know sort of uh, page outfit. And uh, and he went, yeah, you've got a slight Adam's apple there. And I thought, oh, th thanks, thanks, Clay. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go look at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah actually, no, we met with Arthrite before and working with um, David Tennant. You came back to do the sequel to that only a year or so ago. Were you working yeah. with David Tennant in the sequel? Was he there? Uh, yes, I think I think it's, it's an awful thing, isn't it? It was a remote one, so right. Yes, 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 yes. David was in it, but I'd weren't. It was. It wasn't. We weren't in studio together, so you sort of you just doesn't really feel the same. That you're working. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't feel the same. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't well able to. Yeah, hug anyone. I'm a big hugger. I like hugging. So um, yeah. No, you don't feel as though you've met. You forget that you've met people when it's on. Uh, and actually, Zoom is much better. This is much better. Um. Because Big Finish do it on something called Source Connect, where you don't even see people, which is why Colin obviously insists on on Zoom. Zooming cool. first. Zooming first, yeah. Get to see people. Yeah, makes a big difference. I might put that in my rider. <laughs> I insist <laughs> on seeing people's faces. Yeah. Well, India, can I just say, you have been for more than 20 years, about 23 years now, bringing great joy <laughs> um, to many Doctor Who fans because of the character of Charlie. She's certainly... You know, one of the most significant companions the Doctor's had. I think in many ways, you know, the new companions have been formed because of who she was. Um, I think, you know, yeah. Rose, Rose has taken many of her elements. I think, you know, certainly, you know, the, the, the show writers have looked at Charlie and taken elements from her for the modern, you know, she's very much the, sort of the yeah. first modern companion. Um, and yeah. that's down to you. And I think you, you may keep talking about the writers. Um, but good writing is, has to be matched by good acting or it just has no power. And what you've oh, brought well. to Charlie has been so powerful over the last three, three years. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's really lovely of you. Thank you. Well, I've loved every minute of it. And I really hope that like we're talking in another 23 years. <laughs> well, Zipper I'm probably going to talk before already. then. but <laughs> Well, yes, obviously. But what I mean, it's like I hope that Charlie carries on for another 23 years. That would be great. I'm sure I would she will. I play her into her octogenarian Charlie. <laughs> It's India, the beauty of time so travel, time. Though, isn't it? Oh, thank you. Thank you both. It's been really, really lovely. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Eighth Doctor Adventures in the Bleak Midwinter.
Merry Christmas. Oh, I hate Christmas. It isn't a Baker Street Christmas without the Baker Street Advent calendar. Every day in December, you open a new door. They're all numbered, see? One a day until you reach Christmas Eve. I keep seeing things, hearing things. But why would you hallucinate us? Who is this stumbling fellow? I can't quite... Ah! Don't look at it, Eldridge. Behind me. His face! Run! Is the figure following you? Like a dead man lurching to his grave. Oh, I think late Victorian, 1880-something, quickly. The solstice. December 21st. Will you be in Edinburgh long? Winter burnings. Seventh victim discovered his body consumed by a mysterious conflagration. The demon strikes again. What did you make of his hands? One clasped, the other outstretched as if warding something off. A god of fire. What audacity says is true. You will burn, this city will burn, and then the whole planet. The ultimate scorched earth policy. It can't be what he wants. <laughs> You tell ghost stories on the radio. I love that sort of thing. Big finish for the love of stories. Well, I was certainly thrilled to have India Fisher with us, and I can only imagine how thrilled you were, Philip. Yeah, it was great to see. I, I had a lot to do with her when she came out for a convention more than 20 years ago and got to interview her on stage and... You know, I was tasked with looking after her over that convention. So, I mean, I got to know her quite well. So, it was, yeah, it's, it was great to catch up. And um, <laughs> I had been trying to email, you know, email her on and off over the, over the years. And for the last few years, she's not been answering and found out she changed her email address. And that's, you know, I wasn't being ghosted. So I felt much better <laughs> knowing <laughs> I wasn't being ghosted. <laughs> well, that only leaves us to let our viewers and listeners know uh, what we have to recommend for them. So um, what I'd like to... Rec no, I can't. I can see a list over there in the distance, and it's saying, Philip, it is your turn. Wow. You've, you've taken your list with you around Australia. It's amazing. It's a, it's a very well-travelled list. It is a well-travelled list. Um, well, I think I should probably recommend some India Fisher. Um, and I'm trying to work out which one to recommend because I, sh I should have prepared better, but I didn't do. I am going to recommend... Um, I'm trying to think what it's called. The the Dalek one is it? Time of the Daleks. It's uh the yeah, it is the time of the Daleks. Yeah, time time of the Daleks. Because we've had um, to, we've had time of the Doctor, but not time of the Daleks on the time actual of the show. Daleks. So, yeah, so this is um Charlie meets the Daleks. It's got lots of evil the Daleks feels to it. There's there's mirrors and there's time travel, and there's Daleks quoting Shakespeare. And I think any time a Dalek's going to quote Shakespeare, that's worth spending time with. So it's, it's, you know, it's not, not the very, very best she's ever done. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a good average story. It's a lot of fun. It's got some nice little twists in it. It's still part of the whole um, second season Charlie arc of is the web of time or what's going on with the web of time. Um, I mean, the whole second, oh, listen to it all. But it's just a fun episode to listen to. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, Time of the Daleks, a lot of fun. What about you, Dwayne? What are you going to recommend? Well, if we're, if we're going to recommend a Charlie one, I, that wasn't what I was going to recommend. But from that season that you've just uh, pulled Time of the Daleks from, I always get drawn to Seasons of Fear. I love uh, the, the setting of that where, is that, I think it starts off in Singapore, doesn't it? Very uh, briefly, very briefly in Singapore. Right at the start. Because she finally gets there. Wasn't she going to meet up with someone at Singapore? That's right. There's a boy she was going yeah. to meet in Singapore. So the doctor was taking her to Singapore. Took him a while to get there. They finally arrived, but then they work out. Well, they meet someone, don't they, at the very beginning, who tells them they're dead. And they now have to go back through time and try and work out what he's done and how he's done it. And it's it's kind yeah. of like the it's kind of like um, the chases. Every, every episode's a different place. It's been so long. Uh, since I've heard it, I just I think the thing that always sticks in my mind is the big reveal of the monster in that one because it's a classic monster that was often made a bit of a mockery of in classic Doctor Who. Uh, but I was so thrilled to get this monster back, and they did it a lot of justice in this story. I felt yes, yes, and and should be brought back again. I'm surprised that big, I'm not sure Big Finish ever brought that monster back again, and. 
It really. I don't deserved, think so either. No, it deserved a great, and it was really well handled. And yeah, that, but yeah, there's lots of time periods because because it, it's it, they go back to early Rome and other periods. That's um, right. To meet, yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah, Taiwan. In fact, yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant story. But my recommendation is going to be, once again, I'm going to recommend the same thing two weeks in a row because next week, Philip, when we get together, we are going to talk about all seven episodes of Once and Future. And I've been this week starting my re-listen again, and I'm absolutely loving it. Particularly, I've, I've only I'm only three in, but the I think that story, um, A Genius for War, is the, is my favourite so far. Just absolutely the brilliant. Of the one. That is the seventh doctor and Davros one. The the one I missed when I went through them, I didn't listen to that one. I, I somehow missed it. And it, go back this time, yeah, it is brilliant. It's great. It's it is one. it is my favorite so far. They're all good. Yeah. Mm. Um and it's gonna be interesting to talk about because the the series I've seen get quite a bit of criticism for one thing or another. And um yeah, I'm specifically going through these to to find the through lines, like you said you were doing when you did your re-listen too, and making mental notes of them and actual literal notes, believe it or not. I'm making literal Whoa. notes. Can you believe I have things are getting scary notes, if I'm writing them. down? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's my recommendation. Catch up with once in future before next week uh, when Philip and I talk about it. And um well, but we will be back. We will be back before that tomorrow, within the next 24 hours, I reckon, you will probably well 20 bit more than 24. You will hear from us again where we talk about the final of the 60th anniversary specials, The Giggle. So let's see how we go with that one, Philip. Yes, well, it's only going to be positive, Dwayne. <laughs> is it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, okay. We'll see how we go. Tomorrow is a brand new day. <laughs> but uh, And I'll have to get up at uh, 4.30 to see it in the morning if I want to see it before everyone gets up. All right. Fantastic episode. Uh, lovely to have India Fisher on the show. And um, until next time, Philip, we'll catch you later. Yes, yeah, see everyone later. Bye. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 182. Good Charlotte with our guest India Fisher and your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. More about us from sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to let us know what you thought of the episode. Or contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials at Audio Sirens. Thanks for listening, audio files. We'll hear you next time. <laughs>